Hi there. So in this video, you and I are going to sit down together and we're going to come up with a game plan to get you into a new home within the next 90 days. We'll call it, I don't know, home in 90. Now it might take a little longer than 90 days or maybe a little less than 90 days. It really comes down to you and what your specific situation looks like. Now, as exciting as it is to buy a new home, I also know through my own experience, I'm working with a lot of clients, that there is a lot of anxiety and stress that comes along with the process. And sometimes it starts when you first start thinking about buying a home because you just don't know quite what it is you should be doing to get ready. And so then what do you do? Well, you pick up your phone and you start scrolling through Zillow and Redfin and all these other home buying sites and you're looking at homes for sale, but you're not taking any action to move forward and buy them. So if any of this sounds familiar to you, then you're in the right place. Why? Because we're going to sit down, we're going to put together a 10 step process that by following it, it culminates with you getting the keys to a new home. Now the first five steps, we're going to call that the planning phase. This is where you do the things that actually put you in a position to actually be able to purchase a home and we'll allot 30 days for that process. The second five steps, this is the action phase. This is where you actually do things to get into that home. And we're gonna break that into two different categories and we'll give 30 days each to each of those categories. So go get yourself a drink, maybe something to, to snack on, come back, sit down. This is gonna be a little bit longer video, but it's gonna be full of information that you're gonna need. So let's get right into this. So the very first thing, it's a no-brainer, you gotta save up some money, right? Now, I know that sounds a little bit flippant, but really, having cash on hand is one of the most important uh, steps to purchasing a home. You see, when you buy a home, you're gonna have some expenses that need to be paid for right up front before you ever get the keys to that house. I'm talking specifically things like your down payment, there's gonna be a home inspection, you're gonna have to have a uh, appraisal done on the home, and then lastly, it's your closing costs. So let's break this down just a little bit further. First, that down payment. You're gonna to have to have cash on hand, right? You generally need to put down at least 3.5% of the purchase price of the home. So if you're looking at a $550,000 house, you gotta plan on having just slightly over $19,000 cash on hand. Now that's to get an FHA loan. Now if you can swing 5% or better, you can get into a conventional loan. So FHA loans, they're insured by the Federal Housing Administration, but conventional loans, they're not insured by any federal agency. Both types of loans have their benefits and their drawbacks for any type of buyer, but the qualification requirements do differ uh, between the two loans. So it's best that you have a conversation with your loan officer to determine which one of those loan programs works best for you. Now, if you're a veteran and you plan on using your VA entitlement, well, then you can get into a home with no money down at all if you wanted to. So that's the down payment. The other expenses involved are you're going to have a home inspection and an appraisal. And you should probably plan on about $450 each for both of those. Now, we'll talk more about those things in greater detail here in just a minute. And then you're going to have some closing costs. Well, what are those? Great question. These are uh, processing fees that are associated with buying a house, such as fees to pay your lender for the loan processing and to the title company for all the title work that takes place. You can also count on there being some prepaid HOA dues and maybe even some uh, prepaid insurance. Now, closing costs typically run 25 to 3% or so of the amount of the loan. So between your down payment and your closing costs, you're going to want to have somewhere between 6 and 7% of your anticipated purchase price set aside to have cash on hand in the bank. Now, none of this is really set in stone. There's always going to be an exception to the rule. But just think of this as kind of the best practices. All right, so you've got the money in the bank, but what does your credit score look like? You know, your credit score or FICO score, it plays a huge role in your ability to actually get a home loan. Of course, the higher your score, the better rates you'll get and the better loan product you'll get. Now, if you have a credit score that's low, say maybe it's less than 620, it can prove to be a little bit difficult for you to secure a mortgage. But there are loans out there for people who have credit scores between about 540 and 620 
Just understand that the interest rates typically will be higher. Uh, they may require a higher down payment and there might be additional fees associated with those loans. So in order to improve your credit score or to just simply maintain it where it is, just be sure you pay all your bills on time. Don't go out and make any major purchases, whether it's in cash or on credit. And you might want to pay down, but not completely pay off some of your debt. Now I go into this in a lot more detail in this video right up here. So make sure you check that one out after you've watched this one. All right, so what's the next step? So if you haven't already done so, I want you to get pre-qualified, if not pre-approved, with a loan officer. Why? Well, the sooner you start talking with lenders, the sooner you can verify that you can actually get a mortgage. Also, this will give you time to choose which lender you might want to work with. It will give you time to shop rates and products so that you get the best overall loan for your situation. Also, getting pre-qualified gives you a pretty good idea of how much you can afford so you know what price range you should be looking in. You know, a lot of times people think they qualify for a certain amount, but when it comes time to actually apply for the loan, they find out that they either qualified for more or they qualified for less. And one of the saddest things to happen is you fall in love with a home and you get all excited about it only to later find out that you don't qualify for it and you can't afford it. All right, so now let's move on to number four in the process. And this is where we start thinking about the things that we need in a home versus the things that we want in a home. And there is a difference. So I want you to sit down and think about your own personal situation. Do you have a family? Is it growing? Uh, are you living alone? Maybe you're going to have roommates. Consider what you need to have in a house. Do you need four bedrooms? Maybe you need to have a home office because you work from home. Uh, perhaps you need a certain size garage or maybe you need a downstairs master bedroom uh, for the convenience that it provides. Then I want you to uh, make another list of things that you would like to have or your want to haves in the house. These are things like double ovens or maybe an RV gate or a pool or um, you know a larger lot. Now the perfect home doesn't exist. It's not out there. So no home is going to check every single one of these boxes but it does help you narrow down uh, to specific homes and areas that might work for you. Now some other things to consider are do you want a new build home versus a resale home? Those processes are a little bit different. Maybe you think about a neighborhood that you want to live in versus maybe a neighborhood that you would settle for and that you will live in. And there is a difference there. Think about your proximity to shopping, maybe to work, to the things that are important to you. You know what they say, location, location, location. So that is a consideration. All right, and then the last step in the preparation phase, and this is where I come in, this is where you're gonna to wanna to hire a realtor. Now, unless you're looking specifically at for sale by owner homes or FISBO homes, that seller's going to have their own real estate agent, the listing agent, and he's been hired to uh, represent the seller, uh, represent their best interest, uh, work on their behalf to get them the most amount of money for that home. But what about you? Who's going to represent you? So a lot of people think, well, I'll just call the name on the sign, that's the listing agent, and work with him and, and buy the house. Well, in best case scenario, you'll be in a situation called dual agency, and that's where the agent represents the seller and the buyer. But here's the drawback to that. You know, no man can serve two masters. He can't um, negotiate for or against the other side. It's really hard for him to be a total advocate for either one of you. Think of it like this. We all know who Travis and Jason Kelsey are, right? So they played together in the Super Bowl in 2023. Not together, I should say, against each other on opposing teams. Well, think of their parents. Which son did they root for? You can't really root for one over the other, and that's exactly what dual agency looks like when one agent represents both sides. The worst case scenario is you go into this as an unrepresented buyer, so now it's you working on your own uh, negotiating against the listing agent who's trained and skilled in getting the most amount of money for that house. So by hiring your own agent, now you've got somebody on your side, somebody who represents you, who has a fiduciary responsibility to look out for your best interest 
as you negotiate what very well may be the largest financial transaction of your life. So your buyer's agent will help you find the perfect home, they'll negotiate the deal, they'll handle all of the paperwork, plus they'll just assist you throughout the entire transaction. And generally, you don't have to pay your buyer's agent a cent. You see, he or she is usually compensated by the seller, but we're starting to see a little bit of changes in this area as well. Historically, when a seller signed a listing agreement with a listing agent, they talked about the commission that would be paid to the listing agent. They also discussed how much of that commission, what percentage of that commission the listing agent would share with a buyer's agent. And so the seller knew right up front that they were paying a certain commission and, um, to the listing agent, but that a portion of that was gonna go to the buyer's agent. Well, we're seeing a shift here and we're starting to see sellers who are not willing to pay the buyer's agent portion of the commission. So potentially you could run into a situation where you find the perfect home for you, but the seller's not willing to pay a buyer's agent. And in that case, it's gonna be up to you to compensate your agent for the work that he does in representing you. Now, that's a conversation that you need to have with your agent right up front before you even start looking at home so that you guys can come to an agreement on what you're going to do in a situation where a seller is not offering compensation. All right, now before we move on, if you're finding value in this video, give me a like or a thumbs up. Maybe consider subscribing to the channel. Click on that little bell. That way you'll be notified every time a new video gets uploaded. All right, let's move on to the second phase of this whole game plan here, and that's step number six. So this is where we go out and we actually start looking at homes. And we'll set aside maybe 30 days for this process as well. So you've been pre-qualified, you've got your money in the bank, uh, you've got uh, your list of what you need, you know what you want, you've hired your realtor, you have a pretty good idea of where you wanna start looking. This is where the rubber now starts to meet the road. So using all of this information, your agent will set you up with a search in the MLS system to find the best homes that are available that match your specific criteria. Now, you can still do that Zillow scroll if you want, but keep in mind that a lot of times that information is outdated. I can't tell you how many times I've had a client call me and say, hey, I saw this house on Zillow. I love it. I go to look it up in the MLS only to find out it sold maybe three months ago. So keep that part in mind as well. So from your MLS search, you're going to select the homes that you like best and you're going to let your agent know. And then he or she will set up appointments for you to actually go out and visit each one of these homes. Now, don't do anything more than about five per day. If you do anything more than five, they're all just gonna blend together and you're gonna be overwhelmed. So if you can limit it to no more than five, you'll find that that'll be really helpful. And then as you narrow down your search to a couple of final contenders, or maybe it's the one that you've fallen in love with, I want you to go back uh, at different times of day. Go back in the afternoon, right after school lets out. Go back in the evening to see if the vibe has changed or what the neighborhood looks like at night. Maybe go for a walk through the area and talk to some of the neighbors and see how they feel about the neighborhood. Now, another thing at this point, your agent should have provided you with some type of a buyer's advisory. This is um, a document that explains all of the home conditions that should be investigated uh, during the purchase process and it will direct you to sources of additional information on the internet where you can check out crime stats, school districts, maybe the location of registered sex offenders and just a whole lot more information. So make sure you put this resource to use because you'd really be surprised at how much information is out there. Okay, we've got the home, you've fallen in love, we're at step number seven now and that's, it's time to make an offer. Well, what does that look like? So first off, Time is of the essence, so let's not wait too long uh, thinking about it before we actually put in that offer. You see, quite often, the home that you want to sleep on tonight is the one somebody else slept on last night and they purchased today. And that's because generally you're not the only person looking at a home, even in slow times or flat markets like we're seeing right now. So you're gonna rely on your realtor. Maybe he'll run some comps for the area. That's comparisons of similar homes and what they've sold for. But you're gonna rely on your agent 
to help you understand the terms and conditions of the offer you're going to be submitting. Now the offer gets submitted on state approved, state sanctioned forms. It's not something where the agent's just gonna pull out a notebook and write up his own offer. Now here in Arizona, we all use the exact same forms that are provided by the Arizona Association of Realtors, so we're all on the same page. So the offer is gonna consist of a lot of boilerplate legalese, but essentially the purchase price you're willing to pay for the house, how much you're gonna put down for it, um, a closing date that you'd like to have, uh, what type of finance you're, what type of financing you're using, and that kind of stuff. And then that offer, once it's all done and you've signed it, your agent will send it to the listing agent. And we typically give 24 hours or more for the seller to respond. Now, that time frame can vary depending on circumstances, but 24 hours is pretty average. So now the sellers have received your offer and now they've got three different options that they can choose from. One, they can accept your offer as it is, and that would be fantastic although it seldom happens that way. Two is there's aspects of your offer that they are agreeable to, but they want to counter offer back on a couple of other uh, things within the offer. Perhaps, perhaps you offered 550 on a home that's listed at 575. They like the price, but they want a little bit more, so they'll counter back at you know 560. I don't know, I'm just grabbing numbers here, but there's gonna be a little bit of back and forth uh, until you come to an agreement on all of the aspects of the offer. Their third option is, if they don't want to do one or two, is to simply flat out reject the offer. Now that doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's usually because you as the buyer have submitted a really low ball offer and you've, really you've offended the seller and they're just like, forget it, I'm not even gonna deal with, with these people because they're unreasonable. So those are the three options that the seller has. All right, so for purpose of this conversation, we've come to an agreement between the buyers and the sellers. The sellers have uh, accepted your offer. We now have a, it's called a ratified contract. Everybody signed and you're now under contract on this house and this starts the second phase of the uh, action plan, and that's the 30-day escrow process. Now, it doesn't have to be 30 days, quite often it is, but it could go longer or it could go shorter. But once you go under contract, that brings us to the next step, and that's your due diligence period. So what happens during this due diligence period? Well, the first thing you need to do is, this is where the money comes out of the bank for that down payment. You're going to make an earnest money deposit and open escrow with a title company. Now, earnest deposits, they can range from $1,000 to $10,000 or so, depending on the circumstances. So your earnest deposit is a portion of your down payment, but it seldom is the earnest deposit all of the down payment. That's why I said you gotta have you know $19,000 on hand, but maybe you're only gonna put $5,000 down as an earnest deposit. And then also, once you go under contract, the clock starts on a 10 day inspection period. And this is a period where you can go through, you'll inspect the house, the neighborhood. You'll wanna use that buyer's advisory that we talked about if you hadn't already looked at it. Uh, kind of the most important component of the inspection period is this is when you're gonna hire that home inspector. Now, his job is going to be to check out all the major components of the home, such as the electrical, the plumbing, the air conditioning, the roof, and really kind of determine their current condition. Now, it's his job to call out all of the warts. So there will be some deficiencies that will be found. To what extent will depend on the house. But this then gives you the ability, he'll, put, he'll generate a report, you'll get that report, and now you'll negotiate with the seller as to what, if any of the things listed in that report, the seller is willing to repair. Along with that, you do have two other options though. Based on the findings of the report, you can just simply uh, decline to purchase the home and get your earnest deposit back and walk away. The other th option that you have is to ask the seller for a monetary concession to cover the cost of any repairs and you'll take care of it on your own after you've closed on the house. Just remember, again, the perfect home is not out there. So when you do make these repair requests, just be 
reasonable in what you're asking. Uh, years ago, I was selling our own personal home. This is long before I was in real estate. And the buyers didn't like the light bulbs that were in the house. They weren't bright enough. And, on, and so in their inspection report, in their request, they asked that we replace all of the light bulbs. Well, this guy said no, and the deal went through anyways. But just be reasonable. Now, if you want to know more about the home inspection uh, process and what all's involved, that video right there, that's the one you're going to want to watch. All right, let's move on to step eight, and this is your final walkthrough. So the final walkthrough happens just a day or two before actually closing on the home, and this is your opportunity to take one last walk through the house and ensure that it's still in the same condition that it was at the time you went under contract and to ensure that any repairs that were asked for have actually been um, completed. You're also going to want to go through the house and just test all the light switches, you know, randomly check out some of the outlets, turn the water off and on, flush the toilets, make sure the stove works, just, just so you have peace of mind that nothing has changed over the, the escrow period. Now it's rare for you to find issues at this point, but if you do, at least the seller still has a day or two to go ahead and get those things taken care of for you. Okay, here we are, we've reached step 10, the final step of the process, and this is where we talk about signing your documents and closing on the home. Now, one thing that I have noticed is that Arizona seems to be doing the signing and closing way different than what most of you across the country are accustomed to. I think in a lot of places, when you sign all your loan documents and all the paperwork, that is considered closing, you're handed the keys, and you go to your new home. Well, in Arizona, that's not the case. So here, signing will take place anywhere from the day of to three days prior to you actually getting your keys. So for example, let's say your home is scheduled to close on a Wednesday. Well, you very well might be signing all of your paperwork on Monday, but even though you signed everything on Monday, the home still isn't yours. On Wednesday, the loan will fund, all of the paperwork will go wherever it all goes and where it's supposed to be. And once the county recorder's office has received the documentation that they need, they'll issue a new deed that will be recorded with the county. And once it's recorded, that's when ownership changes from the seller to the buyer. And now it's your home. And that's what we refer to here as closing. There you go, we made it through the 10 step process. Now, if you're still with me, thank you so much for sticking it out. I know this was a bit of a longer video and kind of a dry topic, but I hope you found some value here. Now, I know it can seem really overwhelming, but the joy and the excitement that you feel when you actually get handed the keys to that new home, well, that, that can't be beat. So if you are considering making a move to the Phoenix area, or maybe you're already here and you're just thinking about buying another house, then we absolutely would love to work with you. We can help you with new build homes. We can help you with resale homes. We can help you sell your current home. We offer free consultation, so I'll go ahead and put my contact information at the end of this video, but there's an even easier way. In the description of this video, I've put a link, and just click on that link and you can schedule your own private Zoom call with me. Now, we're located here in Queen Creek, so if you wanna know more about Queen Creek, Arizona, then this video right up here is the one for you, and this one down here, this is the one you're gonna to wanna to watch if you wanna learn all about the process of buying a new construction home.